So I, I got to tell you, I'm so overwhelmed uh, to be here in Bethlehem, Pennsylvania, and I'm so thrilled to all of you who came out uh, this evening. Uh, I know that uh, when something is free, people, <laughs> people tend to show up, but I know that it's more than that, uh, that you are actually excited about being here, and I'm so excited you're here, I'm not kidding. This is, to my mind, this is an historic event, and I hope I can make that clear to you, or the evening as, as it unfolds, you will understand how important this is. Uh, this is not just another Socrates in the City event, uh, although those aren't so bad, but uh, this is particularly special. Now, scientists have unveiled a highly anticipated first image of a black hole. I never believed that this black hole was as big as people said until we saw that. It's an event so significant. Astronomers released it at six simultaneous news conferences around the globe. Um, let me just read this. It'll give you, it'll frame things this evening better than I could. It's while Stephen Colbert has called Michael Behe the father of intelligent design. Now, most of you know Stephen Colbert is a renowned man of science. And he, <laughs> there's no, all right. There's no need to mock, all right? He's not the greatest scientist, but he, he's, he's, He's the best they could get for the flap copy. Um, <laughs> Stephen Colbert has called Michael Behe the father of intelligent design. Now, if you don't know what intelligent design is, we're going to talk about that tonight. Behe's arguments have been called close to heretical by the New York Times Book Review. You want to talk about a badge of honor. And Richard Dawkins has publicly taken him to task for his maverick views. Because we don't like mavericks in America, right? We like people who toe the line. Wherever he goes, be he makes ways, but he has remained singularly focused on doing rigorous scientific analysis that points to controversial but incredible results that other scientists won't touch. This research led Behe to challenge Darwin's theory of evolution. What? That's crazy. I had no idea. This is like, I'm not prepared. Are you crazy? What are you doing? Um, wow. It's just straight up crazy. Okay, um, his research, just imagine, you wanna talk about courage, led him to challenge Darwin's theory of evolution in his seminal bestseller, Darwin's Black Box, uh, which came out in 1996, arguing that science itself has proven that an intelligent design is a better explanation for the origin of life, obviously better than Darwin's uh, thesis, right? of natural selection. Now, 20 years later, uh, Behe shows that new scientific discoveries made possible only in the past few decades, and this is where I get excited because I had Dr. Behe on my radio show the other day. This is all new science, new information. Point to a stunning fact. Darwin's mechanism works by a process of devolution, not evolution. We'll discuss that. The mechanism works by breaking down genes which means that evolution can help make something look and act different, at least on the surface, but it doesn't have the ability to build or create anything at the genetic level. We'll get into that. Critically analyzing the latest research, Behe gives a sweeping tour of how modern theories of evolution fall short and how the devolving nature of Darwin's mechanism limits them even further. If we're to get a satisfactory answer to how the most complex, stunning life forms arose, and by the way, we are those life forms. Yeah, congratulate yourself. Um, we need to look beyond Darwin. It's time to acknowledge the conclusion that only an intelligent mind could have designed life. Behind me is what it would look like if you were traveling through a black hole. Now, today's revelation is opening a whole new era. It changes everything in astrophysics. Scientists can now confirm they have seen what they thought was unseeable. Beyond the hole's boundary, the point of no return. Time ends, all matter and light disappear. It's a one-way ticket to oblivion. To know that these monsters exist, that is humbling. The cosmos just gifted them their holy grail. Surrounding the black hole is a swirling disk of super hot plasma. The blackness is the point of no return, where gas, stars, and even light are sucked inside, and no one knows what lies beyond. 
M87 is over 50 million light years away, and that donut is 20 billion miles across. To find M87, scientists linked a network of telescopes around the world to create a massively powerful array. By the way, uh, Eagles is one of his former grad students worked on the team that captured that image and he was very excited to see what discoveries can come from future study and an image of a black hole in our galaxy that's yet to be released. And just how many are there out there and do you think this will help convince the skeptics? Well, skeptics will always remain skeptic um, because most of the time they are not using, you know, uh, facts to base their judgment. But um, certainly this will convince the scientists that uh, there are black holes. And how many black holes there are? Well, this size of black holes, these supermassive black holes, we think there is one in every galaxy and there are billions of galaxies. So there are lots of black holes. These are black holes of the ma of, that have masses of the order a million to a billion solar masses. We know they're out there, monsters of space that scientists believe exert enormous gravitational force on stars and everything else around them. But every one of these images is a guess. They're so far away, no one had ever seen one. At 44 million kilometres across the Sagittarius A star, the supermassive black hole at the centre of our Milky Way galaxy is at least 30 times the size of our Sun. You'd think that would be easy to spot, but at 26,000 light years away, in kilometres that's 2.3 and 17 zeros, Scientists say it's like taking a photograph of an apple on the moon. Cosmologists believe black holes are born when a colossal object, like a supersized star, dies and collapses in on itself. The result is a bottomless sinkhole where all known laws of physics fall apart. They say everything collapses into nothingness. That includes all matter and even time itself. These are the kind of things that make you realize that there's a world that's been inaccessible to us that we can now see. Maybe the most puzzling question, where does material go after it's pulled into a black hole? A question that even the clearest picture may never reveal. It's still too early to conclude whether this affirms or challenges what we know about the laws of physics and space. Well, some of you already know uh, Dr. Michael B. He's a biochemist um, and the author of a number of books, but he is a professor of biochemistry at Lehigh, and I cannot believe I have him as my guest tonight. But I know there are a lot of people here who literally don't even know, like, let's say, what intelligent design is. So would you do us a favor and give us a brief synopsis of what exactly is what we call intelligent design? Well, intelligent design is simply the idea that rather than just the forces of nature, some uh, intelligent being planned or arranged something. And we, we can tell that's the case oftentimes when we see parts that seem not to have anything to do with each other put together to make something that can do something beyond those parts itself. You just say it looks like there's design, but you're not getting into who it was. That's, that's right. I, I think uh, from DNA, from the molecular machinery of the cell, you can tell that it was designed, but there's no signature in the cell, even though Stephen Meyer uh, said there was. Right. Uh, and uh, so I, the, uh, the argument is limited to design itself. Part of the reason people don't like talking about this is I've always noticed that there's a false dichotomy between you know, there are some people who say, uh, you know, the Earth is 8,000 years old, and uh, if you don't believe that, you got to throw the Bible away, and, and, 
and that's that. And we're not going to get into, you know, you're not saying that. It's hard to believe, like, we literally didn't know about DNA until uh -huh. very recently. I mean, there are many people in this room who were around yeah. before we discovered DNA. So it's like 10 minutes ago. And obviously, Darwin didn't have the beginning of a clue of any of these things. That's right. Yeah, he, he, he figured the, the basis of life was simple, uh, jelly, protoplasm, and well, maybe that could shape itself or stretch itself into, into pretty much anything. Isn't it weird, like, if you read science fiction from maybe the 20s or something like that, they talk about protoplasm, and they, they talk about that stuff, like it was a thing. And now we know, like, there was no such thing, but it kind of was in vogue. Um, so now that we know what we know, what is it that you think makes it so difficult for other scientists to at least say, Houston, we have a problem, evolution has problems? Well, uh, as you know, science and religion have a history. And back in the day before Darwin, every educated person thought life was designed and it was obvious because you know birds have wings and fish have gills and so on all these things that fit them to their environment and uh, Darwin uh, Darwin proposed this non-intelligent explanation for life and biology which was then kind of struggling to become a professional science in its own right, right loved it because now we don't have to ask you know the pastors and the ministers for permission to say something about life we'll just figure it all out on our own so there's a kind of a professional jealousy people want uh, biology to be able to be explained in the same way that physics and chemistry can be explained uh, so it's it's a uh, there's a history so the, so the big news that enables you to write this devastating book is that it's no longer speculation. We now can look at the actual mutations and determine whether they are helping the organism and how. And based on your research, well, it, it turns out that they do help them. There's lots of mutations that help. But the bottom line is that overwhelmingly, the mutations are ones that break things that were already there. They take genes that are working in some organisms and figuratively snap them and throw them away, and that helps in some circumstances. I just imagine a lot of people are thinking, well, so what? In other words, if mutation is the genetic code is broken here and that helps, why is that a problem for Darwinism? Well, because it shows that Darwin's mechanism is actually powerfully devolutionary rather than evolutionary. It strongly tends to break things, throw them away, like the example I talked about. And that's not going to be something that constructs sophisticated molecular machinery such as we found. I feel like what you're saying, though, is that, in other words, what this is leading us to conclude is there are these models that exist. There's a dog, there's a cat, there are these different things and you're saying that we can have microevolution and we can break the, the genes and so we can make this kind of a cat or this kind of a dog but we can never, because we're not adding genes or, or whatever, you, you can never breed a dog that will become a giraffe or a horse. You can never break out of the dog wheel rut so to speak. Like it's always going to be some kind of dog. That, that's correct. It's surprising but true that I would estimate that at least a third of professional biologists, academic biologists, think that Darwin's theory is inadequate. That it okay, doesn't. Okay, that, stop. That's amazing. Yeah. Say that again. About a third of non-intelligent design academic biologists yeah. are fed up with Darwin's theory. Okay, they, that's huge to me, like yeah, to hear that. Yeah. Okay. And uh, yet, it's only talked about in professional journals and meetings. When the uh, public media gets hold of it, it's, it's all Darwin all the time. And it is presented as a united front that science says that Darwin's theory is known to explain everything. But, but professional biologists know there's, there's, uh, there's problems right. with it. And, and what, is, what is the big 
fear? I mean, is it fear that science is pointing, mm -hmm. is pointing uh, to something like the God of the Bible and that that's just repulsive to some people? I mean, is that it? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> wow. <laughs> Listen to me, before I made a lot of money, I was reading books, I was going to the seminars, I was listening to self-help audio, okay? Searching online, motivational videos, right? Downloading products, trying to make more money. But what I didn't understand was this, listen to me. The reason why I was not getting the success I deserved was because of me. I was too busy, irritated, that sounds like you. I was frustrated, that sounds like you. And I was constantly unhappy about things that wasn't taking place in my life. Until one day I got up, I looked at myself and said, Wesley, you are successful now. Let's go! You are prosperous. Let's go! Wesley, you are wonderful. Let's go! Wesley, you are rich. Let's go! Wesley, you are powerful. Let's go! I would tell myself that every single day, even though I'll get my lowest. This is the millionaire's routine.